Hello and uh, welcome to today's webinar. Today's topic is going to be really um, a sort of brief cursory introduction and overview to the idea of databases, especially in the context of APL. Uh, as usual, if you are watching live on dialogue.tv, uh, I have Adam who is in the chat. I haven't heard it's not working, so it should be working. And you can uh, ask him, or you can ask questions in the chat, and he'll forward those to me. Um, feel free to ask at, at any time, uh, although I'll leave a bit of space at the end uh, if you want to ask questions then. So, uh, what are we going to talk about today? Well, uh, in this webinar, we're sort of going to cover some very basic fundamentals of what a database is. Uh, we're going to look sort of very briefly at a couple of types of database uh, and then in particular we're going to focus on what are called relational databases uh, but I'll explain that term in a second and uh, finally we're going to again look a little bit about how to use databases with dialogue um, in a couple of different ways. And of the title, as it suggests, uh, this is going to be an overview. So really, there's just going to be a brief look at uh, a variety of things that are available for you to use uh, and a couple of little pointers about how and when you might decide to use which kind of uh, technology. Uh, that should all become clearer as I describe every everything. So. Okay, let's start from the basics. Uh, what is a database? Um, really fundamentally, a database is just a system for storing data. Not actually that complex. Once upon a time, um, before computers were so prevalent, people would write down data uh, or write down information, you know, with pencil and paper or pen and paper on actual paper and then uh, to organize all of that information, you would use physical filing systems. But of course, these days, uh, when you hear people refer to databases, they're usually referring to a dedicated database management system, or DBMS. Now, they also usually mean um, really a specific piece of software called a DBMS that is sort of specifically built uh, for doing database stuff, uh, but for today I'm going to sort of broaden that definition a little bit and sort of say that a database management system at its core is really just a structured arrangement of data um, and there are various structures that exist, I'll sort of allude to that later, and then also along with that is a query language. And a query language is really just a domain specific language for reading that data, um, which can include, I don't know, taking subsets, selecting data based on criteria, um, writing data, uh, inserting, updating, or deleting 
data, uh, and finally manipulating data, which I guess you could also include selecting subsets as part of that. But you know, it includes things like grouping uh, data according to specific criteria, uh, or doing some summations, or actually, in a lot of systems, you can actually get quite complex uh, data handling, even within the query language itself. And different databases will have different query languages, uh, but they're going to be have some commonalities, uh, but also a lot of distinct features that depend on the specific use case uh, that a database system has in mind. So if those are your sort of two main uh, distinguishing characteristics, um, let's look one level deeper then. So the organization of data in databases uh, can often be sort of thought as split into two kind of camps. Um, I think largely for, for historical reasons. Uh, you have relational databases, which, like I said, we'll focus on a little bit more um, for the rest of this, and non relational databases is actually a, a, a quite a, a broad sub topic or uh, categorization. Um, that includes the stuff that's obviously not relational, and this can be here. There's there's a lot of things, but here are four examples: the time series data, key value stores, which are something like large dictionaries, um, document or object databases, which if you know JSON or XML, perhaps those notations can offer quite a good mental model for how those sorts of organizations look. Uh, and graph databases are quite interesting. They're obviously uh, quite popular in things like search engines, where we're largely more interested in the relationships, uh, but the entities themselves will have, I don't know, maybe quite disparate representations. Anyway, like I said, we're not going to focus on, on those. Uh, we're actually going to focus on relational databases for today. And the sort of comforting thing in that is that the... Uh, organization model should be quite comfortable or quite familiar for APL users because it's all basically tables. And as we know, APL handles kind of tabular data quite nicely. Um, so this is just a snapshot. Uh, I'll explain this more in a second of a very simple uh, data model that we're going to use as an example, right? So let's make this uh, let's make this relational data model uh, that we can then use as an example for some other considerations. Now we're, like I said, just talking about uh, relational databases for our specific example, but I think these kind of ideas apply a bit more generally. When you're creating the database at first, um, you're going to have two main uh, targets in mind. Two main considerations. Those are the efficiency. Um, that's both efficiency in terms of the storage, trying to not use too much memory where possible, um, memory or disk space or server space, however it's stored. Uh, but you'll also be considering perhaps the efficiency of the different types of operations you want to do with the data that's in your database. And that can affect which type of database you choose to use. Uh, and then your other kind of main criterion is integrity. And data integrity is also a fairly broad uh, term, but some examples include things like um, some database management systems have inbuilt mechanisms for like taking snapshots of a database at different times. So you can roll back if something's gone wrong to a, to a prior state, um, or they might have uh, strict restrictions on the types of data that can go into any particular column, uh, and that can mitigate, you know, accidentally putting the wrong data in the wrong place. Uh, yeah, I'll talk about more of those ideas later. I mean, what's the other one I was thinking of? Um, in terms of relations. So, if some data depends on some other data, some database systems 
have ways to know that and so you can't like accidentally delete some data that another relationship depends on or something. Anyway, for both of these, uh, the idea of reducing redundancy is quite useful um, because it feeds into both of these quite nicely. Maybe the arrow should go the other way around. Um, in that, obviously, so reducing redundancy means not having the same data duplicated in multiple different places. That has obvious implications for being space efficient in literally not duplicating the data. Uh, but also, yes, the uh, integrity, if you have the same data in multiple different places in your database, then there is more of a chance that you might update data in one place uh, and maybe forget or somehow not update the same, the copy of the same data that's somewhere else. And now you have like mismatching records and that can be a problem. So um, there are some theoretical tools that can help with these things. Uh, for right now, I'm taking an incredibly simple and simplified example um, just to demonstrate some of the basics of, this, of these ideas. Obviously, database systems in real life can get really quite large and complex. Um, that's part of why these tools exist, uh, to help you design things in a way to be you know, kind of as efficient as possible and maintain data integrity and also being easy to use um, when you know when you actually have to do stuff right so this uh, what I'm going to show you is called an entity relationship diagram um, the example we're going to be using is an incredibly simple like I said example of just customers purchasing products uh, from retailers and in, these are our three entity sets so our entities are the retailers, the customers, and the products. And in the diagram, they're represented by rectangles. And so each of these is going to have then their own table in the database, uh, which will sort of list or uh, it will store some of the attributes or properties or, you know, things about these entities. I'll become more clear in a second, I hope. Um, so yeah, so the entity sets are represented by these rectangles and then relationships between the entity sets are uh, represented by these diamonds. Um, and in this diagram, we would now have four tables in total. So we would have three kind of isolated independent tables that don't really depend on anything else. They just you know, the products table just tells you information about the products. That's all, really. However, the, the purchase table, uh, which is a relation, which will represent the relationship uh, that we have here of customers purchasing products from retailers, uh, that's going to have references out to these other tables. So it kind of doesn't really mean anything without the other tables existing. Uh, well, that's not quite true. It's more for... And you know, being able to look up information about the other entities. Like I said, reducing redundancy. So in this model, uh, we've got our entity sets and the relationship between them. Um, and so that's going to be four tables. And the tables are going to have columns populated by attributes, or they're going to be defined as attributes. Attributes are represented in the diagram as ovals. Um, and so here I've just listed some really, again, simplistic ones. So uh, retailers have a name and an address, and customers have a name and an address, and products have a name and a type, you know, in this model. Um, so each of these three entity tables at the moment has two columns each. Uh, purchase table has three columns for these kind of uh, attributes that are um, only sort of relevant to each purchase by itself, the transaction itself. Uh, but it'll also have some reference, and in our model we're going to put explicit columns um, to the entities in the other entity sets that take part in the relationship. Uh, and finally, before I sort of show you what these tables look like, um, it's worth pointing out that so 
you know, these attributes might not be unique. So, I mean, I guess in particular, you could conceive of products, two products having the same name and type, I suppose, although I guess you try to avoid that. Um, maybe there's some legal implications there. Anyway, it's just a simple model. I'm going to try not get bogged down in the details of a real version of this. Um, although in particular, you can imagine the price and the time and quantity of a purchase being the same. So what you'll try to do, if possible, is create some kind of unique identifiers uh, for each of the entities in your entity sets and also for the particular relationships uh, that happen between those entities. So we're going to have a retailer ID, customer ID, product code, and a transaction ID in this simple model. Uh, so that basically just adds a column to each of our tables here. And they're underlined here because that indicates that these are the sort of unique uh, keys for each of these tables. And in particular, in well, I'll, I'll talk about the primary and foreign keys in a second. So, all right, let's turn these into tables. Fairly straightforward. Uh, our products table has the three columns uh, corresponding to its three attributes. Similarly with the retailers and the customers. And then your purchase table has not only the price quantity and date time specific to each purchase, um, but then also these references out product codes of products, customer IDs, and uh, retailer IDs. And in this table, the transaction ID is what's called a primary key. And then these three keys that uh, sort of reference out the other tables are the foreign keys. Right? So that is what enables looking up and stuff. Okay, so hopefully fairly basic, straightforward and intuitive, especially for those uh, using APL. So in a second, we'll, we'll look at turning these into uh, actual, uh, actual sort of database example models. Uh, nothing too in depth. Um, so that's the don't know, surface treatment of the organization, right? Um, you know, the names of some organization schemes that exist, and one example of building one up, building up some tables for a simple data model. The other distinguishing factor in uh, database management systems is this sort of query language, right? And for relational databases, you will usually be using a structured query language or SQL. Um, SQLs have a lot of things in common. There are lots of different types that exist, uh, mostly you know, sort of unique to each database system itself. Um, but a lot of the basic operations are, are pretty much the same. And then non relational databases are also sometimes known as NoSQL databases. I guess that's because a lot of them, you know, won't use SQLs. Uh, for example, there exists GraphQL for graph databases, or uh, especially these days, a lot of database systems offer uh, web APIs. So you can make HTTP requests uh, instead of having to use, you know, other connection methods. So that's obviously quite versatile. However, it's a little bit of a misnomer because some of these uh, database systems also use SQL or an SQL-like language. Um, and, you know, as an APLer, you might think, oh, is this another, this is something, you know, I've spent all my time learning getting good at APL. Is this another thing that I have to learn? Um, you know, the answer is not necessarily, right? As I've been pointing out, and I think this is almost a kind of not completely uniquely, but kind of uniquely APL-ish problem. Uh, the fact that um, APL has, you know, embedded in the language these rectangular arrays that can clearly uh, be used quite readily to represent relational data. If you have, if you meet certain conditions for your application, then you know you can just do everything in APL itself. 
uh, if your data just fits in the workspace, um, if you know you're going to have a single user or process doing the updating of the data, um, and you know that you're only going to be updating the data from APL, then just use APL arrays. I mean, some of you are probably doing this already, uh, and you may or may not be explicitly thinking of it as, as a relational data uh, kind of setup. But of course, uh, these database management systems exist, and you know they're heavily developed. There's a, a whole world of them out there. So there's obviously some benefits uh, and something worthwhile learning SQL or another query language for. <clears throat> Um, in particular, if you have a lot of data, so it doesn't necessarily fit in the workspace, you might consider a DBMS. Uh, that's not necessarily so. Um, if you don't need all of these options, you just have a lot of data. There are a couple of options like memory mapped files or you know just storing data externally using component files or something uh, that can help you get around that. <clears throat> but you're probably going to you are considering a DBMS, have several or maybe all of these conditions. Um, you want those extra features around data integrity. Uh, query optimizers uh, is more of just you know a nice thing that they have because they're using SQLs. It's quite a domain-specific language. I mean, you could argue uh, that the APL interpreter itself is a, is a query optimizer of sorts. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah. Uh, two of Slash three of the sort of more main reasons you might consider a DBMS definitely include um, having good control of multi-user access sort of embedded in the system you're using or sort of taken care of for you. You have multiple users uh, updating the same database and needing to access it. Um, and your DBMS can then take care of things like race conditions. So one user so two users simultaneously trying to update you know data won't step on each other's toes where possible or it'll handle that more elegantly uh, you don't have to sort of write that all yourself um, access control and security you know you might have sensitive data and it might be better to have that stored in one central database uh, somewhere secure and then it's only encrypted versions of the data that get sent over the network instead of having uh, explicit copies of secure data um, on everyone's systems or something like that. Uh, and then lastly, compatibility. So, you know, with um, APL arrays, it's just APL accessing it. There are other ways to uh, allow other systems to access it. But with a database management system, they are widely supported uh, by all kinds of programming languages and software stacks. Um, so that's another big reason why you might want to use one. Before we go and look at turning our simple data model from before into some actual tables, um, I just want to narrow in on uh, two particularly sort of common, uh, slightly distinct organization systems or paradigms of relational databases. These are Online Transactional Processing, or OLTP, and Online Analytical Processing, or OLAP. And OLTP is, as the name suggests, sort of focused around transactions. And what that really means is it's geared to what those systems are going to be geared towards doing lots of insertions, updates, deletes. Um, you can imagine, for example, like a banking system, right? Those are literal transactions of money. Uh, money goes out of one account and into another account, so both of these tables need to be updated at the same time, things like this. Um, and they'll also be particularly geared to handle simultaneous writes from multiple users, so effectively, efficiently, uh, elegantly handling race conditions. On the other hand, online analytical processing databases are geared towards the idea that you're going to not write that often, you know, your data might come in uh, every so often from some place, um, but you're not having loads of transactions happening all the time. But what you are going to be doing is reading the data a lot uh, in order to do lots of analysis on it. And uh, as you'll see in a moment, when I sort of expand on these ideas a bit more, 
uh, these types of systems are a bit better suited for even vectorized operation means basically just more efficient ways of pulling out data um, than an OLTP can provide. So uh, I've talked about a lot about uh, you know APL, just use APL arrays or reasons why you might use a DBMS. Um, but actually, you've got a kind of spectrum of options in between or, or along that uh, sort of axis. Um, and we'll look at a couple of these. Well, we'll look at inverted tables versus matrices in a bit more detail. Um, but I'm just going to mention these four particular options that you might be interested in, depending on your use case. So APL matrix we'll look at in a second is very intuitive. Inverted tables is only slightly less intuitive, but offers some performance benefits. And then there are these things called data frames. Data frames? I mean, they're packages that are these data frame systems. Um, and when you look at them, well, they become more popular in recent years. Uh, when you look at them, they, they seem to really just be a bit like what APL provides for APLers, which is a, a sort of nice interface for having tables of data and uh, a set of functions and operations that enable you to do analysis on them um, quite conveniently. Uh, and in particular, two quite popular packages are Pandas for Python. Uh, and then if you wanted you know, to use that system, you can interact using the Pineapple dialog Python bridge. And R has a package called data.tables. Um, and uh, Kim Molina recently showed us uh, him interacting with data tables using his own uh, dialogue to R interface called RS Connect. Uh, so thanks a lot for showing us that. And uh, you know, if you're interested, please check these things out. Um, and then finally, on the far end, DBMS, like we said, uh, for all the reasons listed before, um, to kind of drive this sort of idea home a bit more and with a bit of a visual aid, uh, one of your considerations for choosing any of these different options might be you know, what's the data locality you're expecting to have most of the time in your application. So if you're just dealing in the workspace all the time, then go ahead and just use APL arrays. Um, if your data doesn't quite fit in the workspace, there are options for that. Could be just separate files, CSV or component files, or memory mapped files so you can do the analysis on the data that's on the disk directly. And then these data frame packages really are, you know, a, a dialogue user is likely to be using them just because um, they either are getting the data from, from those places anyway, that's where they're re receiving it from, or they're just expecting that uh, a lot of R users or Python users are going to want to access the data as well. Um, so that's why they might choose to use something like that. And then, uh, as I said, database management systems. I mean, you can well install a DBMS on your local system to store lots of data and have all, a lot of those benefits. Uh, but it's also very likely that in a, a large production system, uh, you're going to have either, I don't know, some server in your organization or perhaps using some cloud service to, to store really large amounts of data. That's why. Another reason to, to decide about that. All right, so that's quite a lot of uh, high level sort of discussion about those ideas, about what databases are, the different kinds, why a dialogue user might use them. Uh, let's take a quick look at some examples to make a couple of ideas more more concrete. So um, we're going to take our data model from before and look at a nested matrix representation of it. So I'll move over to my workspace here. And I do have a demo prepared, which, as you know, is nice and risky. Uh, let's see how it goes. So <laughs> um, Yeah, the first thing we're looking at is, is, is just using nested matrices, right? Uh, firstly, I've got my data stored in CSV files. Um, 
of course you can just in the Windows ID, well actually uh, Android as well, just uh, go to Quad CSV and press F1 um, and you will go to documentation so you can see more about the various options for how to import data in different ways or export data uh, but for this particular example um, I'm using Zilda which sort of says it's the standard UTF-8 Unicode text file, no special encoding there. Uh, for means if a field can be interpreted as uh, numeric data then please give me numbers rather than characters in my workspace. Uh, and the one just means the first row of my CSV is headers, so it's the names of columns, the header containing the names of columns and I want to bring that in separately. Here I'm using strand assignment to put them to put the headers into underscore Cole's names. Uh, so I guess we can look at purchase Cole's, what they're called, the CSV file. Um, yeah, boxing's already on, so that's good. I'm also turning rows on. I've just put this here, uh, boxing on, so that we can see this nested structure a bit more clearly. And I'm turning rows minus fold equals three, just in case I accidentally type something uh, that causes a large amount of output and it will truncate that for me and won't cause the session to scroll forever. Okay, so let's just look at the first few entries in, in uh, our customers table and our products table and our retailers table. And here are the first five purchases. Um, so obviously the really nice thing about nested matrices is they basically look exactly the same as our representation from the data model. I mean, they're just tables. That's obviously really nice. Uh, and then from there, well, as I said, your query language gets to be APL, and that's really nice. Uh, because if you've learned APL, that's obviously intuitive, certainly convenient. Um, I won't get to that point yet. So for example, here I've prepared uh, I'm going to scroll up a little bit. Yeah, let you look at that for a second. Um, I prepared just a couple of functions that define, you know, the very bare basics of some kind of DSL that has some semblance of uh, SQL ishness. Um, I'm not going to go into details on how these are defined, other than to point out the use of execute here and there um, means that in this case, I'm always referring to tables and columns and uh, you know specifying literals of the values within columns using character vectors. So it has this kind of nice consistent look and all my functions are APL names and everything that's sort of a name in the database is, is a character vector. So that's kind of neat. So here I'm getting all the customers uh, that live on an address with the word ugly in it. Uh, so Ugly Avenue, Ugly Road, and Ugly Street. So, you know, that's just a simple kind of selection. It's just APL, right? Um, something you might want to do is like an update, and you could do this with a simple uh, search and replace with quad R. So either they've renamed all of these roads or everyone's moved, I don't know. <clears throat> like I said, it's just sort of, it's, it's sort of fairly simple uh, for this, and you would probably build up all your own functions that depend, you know, are very specific to your use case. Um, one last thing worth pointing out with this sort of framework is, you know, it's a good idea to keep the, um, sorry, to keep the format of your tables very regular. So for example, in here, the primary keys of all my tables are always in the first column. So, you know, if I, Ever want to reference a key of a table, I've got the table name and I'll just take the first column. Um, but that type of consistency can help you make a better query language. But uh, as I uh, sort of jumped the gun with PowerPoint um, and sort of alluded to a little bit earlier, with this representation, once you've got a lot of data, uh, performance can start to suffer. Um, 
So, for example, this nested matrix here, uh, although we can just see the values in our display, in the session right here, um, actually, what you have is an array of pointers within the interpreter under the covers. Uh, and so, you know, in memory, that's going to be a sort of list or vector or list of pointers next to each other, but then they're pointing to other potentially disparate locations in memory. Um, and that becomes a not especially efficient access pattern. So even if, you know, if I'm taking one column, even if those are columns of rows that are contiguous, that are directly next to each other, the interpreter is still having to do a bunch of po uh, pointer chasing to get that data free bit, um, which is not especially efficient. So uh, I'll show you this before uh, before I show the example. So one uh, data structure and framework that exists in the APL world, well, it's referred to as an, as an inverted table, uh, can help mitigate those performance problems. In the APL world, these are called inverted tables. Um, in the database world, they're often referred to as column-oriented or columnar databases. And one thing that's kind of neat is you can see that converting from the nested matrix into uh, an inverted table is just split transpose. Uh, so I'm just going to take the first three of each of these to demonstrate <clears throat> the idea. Um, you can already see, for example, that instead of having a pointer for every single, you know, in the display representation, a box basically means a pointer. Right, so instead of having a pointer for every single item in my table, I've got on the top level just uh, a pointer for each column. So that's already going to be a lot more efficient. And then uh, within that, you can see that now you know you've got data of the same kind, all right directly next to next to each other. Uh, so that's a more efficient way both of storing the data and for retrieving the data. So uh, the convenient thing is that your language gets to be APL again. Uh, although obviously, well, I don't know, it's not obvious, but uh, pro it's likely that the DSL or the, the APL that you write to handle that data is going to be slightly more complex. Uh, you might want to use 8iBeam. Uh, thinks inverted table index of. Uh, and it's relatively convenient, right? Um, you know, you're still in APL the whole time, still dealing in the workspace. Um, but the real reason you'd do this is in order to get that good analytical performance, right? In the OLAP sort of regime, where you're expecting that you're going to be reading from these columns especially like chunks of the columns at a time a lot right that's why you might sort of use this um another sort of small note is in my particular representation right now uh in my particular representation right now i you know i've been using these vectors for the keys that's kind of just to make the model a bit easier to look at um but obviously these are nested vectors in and of themselves so one way of being sort of more efficient again is to make sure that all of the arrays that constitute the columns uh, are simple homogeneous flat arrays themselves. So we can just mix each of these uh, and create text matrices which are going to be more efficient both in terms of the space and the lookups that we do. Yeah okay before, uh, before I move on to just sort of very briefly touch on yeah, okay um the proper database management systems i've got a couple of points one will i publish this demo script yes i'm going to add it to the uh dialog event calendar um it'll be published basically after this slash tomorrow um and very canon comments that thank you hello uh, naming your columns makes it easier to insert columns rather than hard coding column numbers. Yes, so this is actually a very fair point. So you don't have to um, 
I guess this works for all of the. Well, no, that's an inver. Is that a suggestion uh, for the actual nested matrix representation itself that you sort of index into the headers? Or is it more like convert them into a nested table and name each, instead of having a single nested vector uh, of each of your columns and then still having to index into them, right? Oops, well, it's not a matrix, so... Um, uh, no, he's referring to customers one. Uh, then you can name your columns and this makes it a bit easier. So, <clears throat> in the interest of like, uh, Ah, uh, right, right, right. Okay, sorry, I've got to, sorry, I've had a nice comment here. This makes a lot of sense in the context, but I think I'm going to use it to just briefly mention uh, one other thing, which I'm not going to demonstrate right now, but <clears throat> I will um, sort of link to it in the description of the YouTube video that this becomes afterwards and probably attach some reference to it wherever else this webinar is mentioned. Um, so Ray says, yeah, instead of, so I can just say that... Uh, that my customer code is one and all the other ones it's the customer columns right so the id the name and the address although obviously that's dangerous you'd probably want to call them customer address b name um gets one two three and then when you do your indexing all the time uh then you can use sorry it's customers then you can use the names themselves, uh, which could make it, you know, a lot easier to do this types of referencing. Um, this is one really nice way to improve your your DSL, as it were, or um, make it a bit more friendlier to use. Uh, another thing that uh, another approach is to convert uh, these representations into namespaces or other types of objects, maybe classes. Um, <clears throat> maybe not so much for relational data, certainly with keyed data. Uh, you could have keyed properties within a class, and then you can index using the names directly like that. Or um, you can convert your table to uh, an array of JSON objects, and then you can use the object-oriented dot syntax uh, to refer to the columns. Um, of more directly as names rather than even using character vectors or assigned numbers like this. There are lots of different approaches to doing that type of thing. Uh, yeah. So, yep, these are cool. But, you know, you have to do. You, if you've got a very particular system it's def or, or you really want to understand this stuff, it's definitely worth uh, kind of trying to develop your own systems like this. Uh, but if you want some kind of hints or a bit of groundwork, you can watch uh, Roger Huey's Dialogue Team User Meeting presentation on inverted tables, um, where in there you'll see a couple of uh, functions that can be used readily with inverted tables. Um, you will, yeah, you'll probably want to, to write cover function, inverted table cover functions for certainly all the structural primitives, but a lot of stuff. Yeah, indeed, a cover function. I mean, this is the thing about building up the DSL in real life, right? This is a super simple example just to demonstrate some, I some really, really basic ideas, but as it gets more complex, you're going to be, uh, creating cover functions for everything and literally developing a more robust uh, DSL. Um, but if you don't want to necessarily do all that yourself, there are a couple of other uh, offerings, um, at least in the APL world. So Dialog has an open source project called VecDB that exists, and that's a fairly simplistic, um, you know, relative to, to DBMSs. Uh, columnar database system that uses memory mapped files uh, to allow you to process 
large amounts of data in a fairly convenient way. Um, and then for, ex for an example of a sort of more hardcore system that's been developed, FlipDB from Carlisle Group is, is based on APL is, uh, and is actually a, yeah, I think, uh, sorry, I'll get to that comment in a second, um, is actually a, you know, more full featured database management system built on, built on top of APL. And I believe that's also, uh, largely column oriented, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but that's like a, I think a paid product that you have to purchase from, from Carlisle Group. Um, yeah, indeed, cover functions for finding the, finding the names. Uh, can I do this quick? Time. I'm going to say no. So the annoying thing is in this demo script, uh, in a previous version, I had actually written a, a like a cover function called P code or something. I think it was products code should be like products, uh, one where actually, I think you start with the product columns index of inclusive simple the other thing uh uh oh no so that's because you just want the name i guess uh and i believe it's uh, sorry about this all right so it's all lowercase okay so you look for the name and then you're actually going to be indexing into products themselves uh, in the name column and which ones do you want you want the probably shouldn't be doing this for time for time's sake but uh, uh, those uh, wait oh, the, you want the p code uh, sorry, I'm making a right hash of this. Let's just build it up, right? So product four is what it was. Oh, sorry, uh, two is what I found before. Okay, okay, I can do. It. Okay. Uh, la la. Uh, uh, uh. Products index, that's all lowercase. Okay, there we go. And then we're going to look up the, um, that's definitely going to be enclosed. Now we're going to look up what we're actually after, which is oranges. Uh, and then we're going to use that to index in the first column, because as we said before, it's a good idea. All right, there we go. And then you'd call that P code. Uh, to keep your 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 primary keys in the first column and a okay yeah so what's the pre p code for water and then it's this one and because I've used enclosive simple I can get several product codes at once is this the there's the bottles so you'd also add error handling for when you write the wrong thing and other things like this Sorry, probably shouldn't have gone on that little tangent, um, <laughs> considering the time I have left and what I was hoping to show in this webinar. But uh, hopefully that's the that's the idea that Jay was talking about. Hi Jay, thanks for the comment. Uh, right, yes, APL, you know, basically has tables. Uh, if you haven't seen inverted tables before, that's possibly uh, something that you might not have, uh, you know, it's a type of table you might not have thought of. But like I said, uh, if you have certain particular requirements or large, robust systems, you can reach for, you know, proper, full-fledged, dedicated database management systems. Uh, I'm not able to do a comprehensive comparison of any kind, and this isn't even a recommendation, really. But I'm just mentioning the names of two particular DBMSs that exist. Uh, MariaDB um, is a pretty typical example of an online transactional processing database system, and uh, ClickHouse is one of these column-oriented systems 
for analytical processing. Um, and another thing I guess is worth saying is, in principle, you can store any type of database system in any of these kind of uh, organizational structures or database systems. Um, and in fact, sometimes you'll be mixing and matching, like you might use an OLTP system uh, to sort of do the ingesting of data from your sort of front-end services where customers are causing transactions to happen. And then maybe on some regular basis, oops, sorry, maybe on some regular basis, a bunch of that data uh, is being pulled into your OLAP. And so then um, later on, when an, anal an analyst comes along and wants to do analysis, uh, they've got those performance benefits at that time. So we've looked at APL array examples. <clears throat> I thought, although time is getting the better of me, that uh, a sort of overview of database stuff <clears throat> probably wouldn't be uh, that complete without at least one little demo of SQAPL, which uh, comes with dialogue and is the way, uh, you know, is one of the main ways that you can connect dialogue interpreter to one of these uh, dedicated DBMSs. Um, so it kind of has three main levels of abstraction available to you. So one is just load data, the load data workspace that comes with installations dialogue. Well, all of this SQAPL stuff does um, <clears throat> that I'm showing now. And this offers some pretty high level kind of functions for easily reading and writing uh, data. So uh, I'm going to copy load data into my workspace here, and I'll just show you three of the functions that exist, load SQL, save SQL, and test SQL. Uh, you know, they're good for basically taking whole uh, APL arrays and shoving them into databases or getting tables from databases and pulling them all out as entire APL arrays. Um, then there's SQAPL, which is a namespace, and in particular we'll look at a couple of examples of the do function. Yes, Kimo, you are right. Hello. Uh, MariaDB is a sort of a fork of MySQL, and I believe it's another one of these, uh, you know, I think MySQL was all free open source software once upon a time, and then some corporate entity that I don't know the name of is now in now in charge of it, and some free open source type people slash uh, have have made a fork so that they can keep developing it as a free open source piece. Of so Maria D DB is very closely related to MySQL, which is also a very popular uh, OLTP system. All right, so SQAPL, if you copy the, the whole workspace in, uh, contains a lot more functions, uh, including some that constitute a kind of low-level interface. Um, I won't get into in any detail right now, uh, but it's useful to know about the different le levels of abstraction depending on what you're trying to do. If you're just trying to get data in and out of a workspace from and to DBMS, load data is fine. Uh, if you want to just e execute SQL statements over and over, especially in the uh, in the session like this, uh, then SQA.do uh, is a function you're probably going to want to use. Um, so before I connect, let me show you the other half, right? So yeah, lower level interface is the other the other kind of part there. So uh, the big document is the Dialog APL SQAPL interface guide, or I think on the documentation center it might be listed as SQL interface guide. Maybe not, maybe I'm talking rubbish, doesn't matter. Uh, the point is, this document obviously contains like all the stuff you can do, but I'll just point out some of the most basic things right now. But before that, you're going to need to install the database system, right? It's a separate system from Dialog. This is obviously going to be specific to whatever database DBMS you use, uh, this is the website for MariaDB. Um, there'll be the DBMS itself as a package. Uh, the fair question, like three. 
probably, almost certainly. Uh, maybe one time. Maybe what we should do, uh, a good shout is to be <laughs> if someone can help me. Uh, get a decent list of commonly used DBMS systems, including I think SQ SQ Lite is one of these no SQLE type dealies. Uh, because they're like file based, aren't they? Whatever. Um. You know, it's not got all the. It's not as quite as heavyweight as as MySQL or MariaDB. I'll I'll come back to that one in a second. Um. So the question that I've just been rambling like a, like a buffoon about is: Can SQA PL talk to a local SQLite three database? And my answer is: I probably. Well, we can find out. I'm not going to Google it right now, but. If uh, so, SQAPL is basically an, uses ODBC connection, right? So if SQLite has a ODBC driver, which I should have just gone on with this, it would have answered the question. Um, not only do you install the database, the DBMS itself, but you'll also need to install the related ODBC Open Database Connectivity Connector, and every database will have their own one of these um, and the in, you know, there's a different installer for each one and for each platform but they almost always support Microsoft Windows, Mac OS and Linux which Dial obviously runs on all of these um, so you can connect to databases cross platforms. So you'll install the ODBC connector uh, go to several pages and click several things. If you're using Linux or Mac, the website for the specific DBMS will have all of the installation instructions, which are like your uh, incantations. You just copy and paste those for the most part. On Windows, you'll need to go to the Windows specific uh, data source manager. Um, don't forget to match the bit width. You're probably going to use 64 bit most of the time, but 32 bit exists as well. And then it's just a menu you want to add a, a, a what's called a data source name. <clears throat> it's called a data source name on Mac and Linux as well, by the way. Um, and when you add that, provided you successfully installed the driver, you can select the correct the correct driver for your DBMS. <clears throat> Got too many here. And then you'll get some menu that's specific to the the database driver itself, where you'll put in. You know, particular details that vary by DBMS. Uh, so in this case, I've created a source. I've called it MariaDB, that, but I can call it that anything. And the driver is the MariaDB ODBC 3.1 driver. Okay. Uh, I really, really apologize for rattling through this last bit with uh, ostensibly three minutes left, but I guess we can we can leak over a little bit. Apologies uh, if you're watching live and I'm and I'm running over a little bit here. Once you've set up uh, your DBMS and the D DSN, the data source name for the connection, you can then use SQA.connect. Uh, the first item in your argument is going to be an identifier for the connection, so it's just a simple text scalar or vector. Um, for the duration that the connection's open, I'll refer to this one as MD. Then MariaDB is the data source name that I created, as I showed you just then. Uh, then it's your password. Probably should be something more secure than that. And you should, and then it's your user um, for the database system, not the system user. And once again, you probably shouldn't be always connecting as root. Uh, these things but this is just for a demo so let's rattle through this for the last two minutes but right, um, you know from here sqa.do it's pretty convenient for just executing arbitrary uh, sql statements uh, and you can put them as you know literal text vectors like this um, so i'm going to be using the retail database i've set up for the retail model that I showed a little while ago. Oh, scary. Uh, little loading circle. If your queries get a bit more involved, a bit more complex, then it's a good idea to store them as uh, character vectors. So this is a, actually a, a simple character vector with embedded new lines in it uh, for creating the purchase table. 
so then I can just use that. Um, I've already created that table, so I get an error back. So if you get a zero on the left, it means you know no error, successful execution of the SQL statement. Uh, if you get a number back, it's some kind of error. Again, more details are in the in the document itself. Um, and then save SQL is actually from the the load data workspace, but it's a convenient way uh, to have a load of data in. Um, if you look in the details of this, along with document, uh, you can see how to use either sqa.do or the low level interface, um, which has some benefits if you're managing the database programmatically. Um, these cover functions or these sort of higher level functions, while convenient, uh, might not be the most efficient thing um, to use. And this was just sort of to demonstrate that the arrays round trip, if you especially, particularly if you make sure to set your data types correctly. Because uh, prior to this, I'd actually set the date time as a as a, a wide character string thing as well. Uh, and so I was getting confused as to why my returning array wasn't matching my output array. And it's because it was storing these numbers, I'm using dialog date numbers just for convenience of this demo, uh, it was storing these as character vectors and so when I saw the printout here I couldn't tell the difference but they weren't, the arrays weren't matching up. I've also put over sort here, so match over sort because the database system itself ended up storing the data in a different order uh, than it was in my APL array, um, so just be probably aware of that. And I guess you can do some other basics. Um, you know, <laughs> to show the show some properties and select some data. Sure. Um, and at the end, don't forget to close your connection. Uh, especially if you have access limits, that would mean that would prevent a sorry another user from accessing the database. Right. And with that, I'll say that's you know kind of what I wanted to cover just for today. In terms of overview, database, it's just system of data of organizing data and a query language, uh, a DSL for handling that data. Uh, they're large, generally split into either relational or non-relational databases. We looked more at relational today. Uh, and for relational databases in APL, you have plenty of options. This isn't even really everything, you know. Uh, and we already saw from some of the comments as I was going through things that people are well aware of certain ideas you can use to make your own uh, self-made database-ish systems uh, nice to use. Um, so, you know, if you just want to use APL matrices, that's quite convenient. Inverted tables uh, have potential performance benefits for certain types of data access. Uh, data frames exist <laughs> and uh, in other programming languages. Um, so if you need to interact or you're expecting other users to use those languages, that can be uh, convenient. And DBMSs are kind of the big dogs. Uh, large involved systems with lots of features that we haven't even really touched the surface of today. As I said, it's a huge topic. Um, with loads more we're going to cover in the future, including probably, well, sorry, probably, you know, uh, more treat specific treatment of inverted tables uh, and different permanent storage methods, uh, more detailed treatment of SQAPL and some related tools uh, for more pleasantly dealing with databases from Dialog. Also, it would be really interesting. To cover non-relational databases of which there are many types uh, and also non-ODBC interaction. As I sort of mentioned earlier, one of the things that a lot of modern DBMSs have is like a, a REST API or some other HTTP API, so uh, you don't have to necessarily just use ODBC drivers like I showed, talked about today. Um, so thank you very much everyone who's been watching. Uh, while I wait just another minute or so in case anyone's got any further comments or questions to pass over, 
Um, I will leave you both with the sort of dates for upcoming APL related events and stuff. So uh, in a week's time, same time, uh, also via Zoom, but details are different. Oh, sorry, this wasn't. This is YouTube. What? A... <laughs> That pandemic year has got got to me. I think every time I'm talking to a computer, I'm assuming I'm on Zoom. Um, it's a British APL Association open session, so that's a week from now is the next one, and they are every two weeks um, ongoing. So go to britishaplassociation.org forward slash webinar hyphen schedule hyphen 2021 uh, to see when those are and how to join them. Then at the end of this month, uh the this year's round of the APL problem solving competition closes. That's the last day you have to enter, submit your entries. And also, if you told someone else about the competition and they are an entrant, uh don't forget to remind them to put your name down as a referrer, because if they win uh, a cash prize, then you will be eligible to receive an equivalent cash prize. Money for nothing almost. Uh, so that's coming up. Then moving into next month, uh, on Sunday, the August 1st, is the next APL campfire. So these are uh, sort of online meetups hosted by Adam Brzezewski, Um And they're kind of, uh, they're focused on like, the history and wider context of APL and people, uh, APL users coming and sharing their stories. So if you are interested in the history and community, surrounding APL, then that's a great meetup to attend, uh, if you can. And then, uh, as I said, BAA is every two weeks, uh, but a month from now will be the next Dialogue webinar here on Dialogue.tv, and that's going to be Adam uh, giving the next part of his series on error handling from Dialogue. Um, and there's been no more extra questions uh, coming in that time, so I'm going to assume that I'm good to finish now. And uh, But before I do sign off, I want to say a big thank you to many of my colleagues, uh, including in particular Brian Becker, uh, Gitta Christensen. Well, Adam always helps me with the webinars, so maybe he doesn't need anything explicit. Uh, Josh David as well uh, for helping me run through these and, and choose which talk about a little bit. Um, if people didn't like it, then then your name's thrown in with me. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. No, thank you uh, seriously a lot, because it's been really helpful. Um, but as you can see, there's a lot of uh, potential ground to cover here. Uh, so no doubt this this is not the last you've heard of, of, about databases with dialogue. So, uh, yep. Thank you. Just check, just second there's just no more yep all right thank you very much for watching uh and i'll see you around okay goodbye